The dehydration of alcohols to create alkenes is an elimination reaction. The mechanism is going to depend on whether or not you start with a primary alcohol or a secondary or tertiary alcohol. So before you decide which one you're going to use, let's make sure we're all on the same page about what those words mean. This molecule, the OH, is connected to this carbon. The question is, how many other carbons is it connected to? In this case, it's only one other carbon, so it's a primary alcohol. Here, the OH is connected to that carbon. It's connected to one, two other carbons. That's secondary. OH is connected to this carbon. It's connected to one, two, three other carbons. That's tertiary. And here, the OH is connected to that carbon, which is only connected to one other carbon, and so it's primary. These two, that one and that one, will react via an E2 mechanism. The other two will react via E1, and we'll get to that. Now, an E2 mechanism, the two represents bimolecular. That means there's two things colliding in the rate limiting step. The rate limiting step, I believe, is the second one here. So let's just talk about what's happening here first. The very first step of this is for um, some acid. I'm going to use H2SO4 here, and I'm going to draw it in a, in a weird way. I just want to emphasize that the H isn't connected to anything other than the other oxygen here. And the lone pair on the OH will take that hydrogen away and leave a minus charge on the anion. The products we get out of that are the same long carbon chain we start with, but now instead of it being an OH group, we have what's called an alkoxonium, alkyl oxonium ion. It's basically a carbon chain where the OH has been converted to an H2O, and there's still a covalent bond between the oxygen and the carbon, but because water is such a great leaving group, it's, it's a severely weakened bond, and it's very open to being broken. We still have one lone pair on the oxygen and a formal charge of plus one that's countered by the extra minus charge left on whatever the conjugate base of the acid you used was. Now, the question is, if we're going to eliminate this part of the molecule, we need to eliminate a hydrogen off of the next carbon in order to leave behind the double bond. I'm going to draw in those hydrogens here. That next carbon here has one, two extra hydrogens on it. Now, technically, this one does as well, but I didn't need to show those. What's going to happen here is the conjugate base of the acid, which again, the acid gave away its H to make the OH into OH2, is going to steal one of the hydrogens on the carbon next to the carbon that has the OH on it. It's stealing the H and those electrons have, they need to go somewhere. They're attracted to this bond because the electronegative oxygen is sucking electron density in this direction. So those electrons end up going into or between those two carbon atoms, but each carbon can't have more than four bonds. So this covalent bond breaks, and those electrons are not absorbed, but they're taken by the oxygen, because oxygen is electronegative. You have the flow of electrons heading towards the electronegative atom. You are breaking that covalent bond between carbon and hydrogen. You're breaking this covalent bond between oxygen and carbon. But then you're forming a double bond between the two carbons that are there. In the end, our products here, I still have the long carbon chain. Oh, am I missing one more? There we go. Except now I have a double bond at the end. The HSO4 minus took its extra H, so it's now H2SO4, which is actually how it started, so it's a catalyst. And you have H2O as a product. Ah, look, dehydration, because you're taking a water out of the molecule total. Now, granted, this hydrogen came from the acid, and uh, the 
other, the new hydrogen that's attached to this HSO4 came from the carbon chain. But hydrogens are not, like you can't tell the difference between those unless you make one some kind of weird isotope. And that's probably how we figured out what the mechanism was. But the point is that you're protonating the OH to make it an OH2 group, super easy to leave. As long as you pluck a hydrogen off of the next carbon in the chain, the electrons flow around to create that double bond. It's beautiful. Please note that in what I believe is the rate determining step, which is this one to that one, you have two molecules colliding. That makes it a bimolecular reaction, and that's why it's called E2. Want to talk about E1? I bet you... Oh, that's not, that's not the right sheet. Want to talk about E1? I bet you do. Let's go. So for E1, the one here represents unimolecular. It is a single thing that is doing its magic in the rate limiting step. Okay, so what actually ends up happening here, we're still going to have to protonate the OH. I'm gonna give you H2SO4 again. I don't know, I'm just picking an acid. The lone pair on the water still steals the H. You still end up with the alkaloxonium ion. Here I've got OH2. I'm just gonna be a little, uh, there we go. We got our plus charge on the oxygen there. And of course we have the HSO4 minus that's left over. Okay, but that's easy. It's a strong acid, it gives away its H piece of cake, right? Now for secondary or tertiary alcohols, what happens is that this OH2 actually falls off of the molecule entirely. The only electron flow happening here is going to be electrons flowing out of the covalent bond between carbon and oxygen, straight to the water. This is a unimolecular decomposition because it's one molecule breaking apart into two. What you end up with is that same carbon chain, but now you've broken the water molecule off and you're left with a positive charge on this carbon, the carbon that the OH fell off of. This is why, or rather this carbocation intermediate is the reason this mechanism only occurs for secondary and tertiary alcohols. A primary carbocation, a plus charge on a carbon that isn't connected to more than two other carbons, is not very stable at all. You need that carbon that has the positive charge to be connected to at least two other carbons in order for it to be stable enough to operate as this intermediate. Great. Now I wanna point out that you have two hydrogens connected to this carbon and two hydrogens connected to this carbon. Which hydrogen gets plucked off of the molecule will depend on a few different factors like if there's blocking groups or steric hindrance, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're, uh, for a molecule this simple, where it's just two H's over here and two H's over here, you can probably get away with grabbing either one. In fact, let's show that happening to both. Now, the H2O, or maybe we'll use the HSO4 here, something needs to steal this hydrogen away. I think I'm gonna choose the water to make that happen. Um, the water molecule is going to steal, let's say, that H away. Where are the electrons from this covalent bond going to go? Well, they're going to flow towards the positive charge because electrons are negatively charged and negatives and positives attract each other, right? If you pluck a hydrogen off of this carbon here, then your resulting molecule will have a double bond between those two carbons. Now, is it going to end up being cis or trans? As far as I recall, trans is preferred as the product. It's not uh, specific in that it's 100% trans, but trans is the major product as opposed to cis, okay? You could just as easily have had the water pluck off one of these hydrogens. In that case, you would have ended up with your double bond between these two carbons. 
the carbon that had the positive charge and the carbon you pluck the hydrogen off of. And again, I'm going to draw that as trans. Now, this because you have hydrogens on both of the carbons on either side of the carbocation, I could imagine both of these products getting made. And realistically, I could also imagine, I just want to make sure I draw this correctly, I could also imagine a cis form also being there, but as a minor product. Now I got to draw this one just so I'll draw the double bond there. One, two, something like that. That's the same number of carbons. And this is also a minor product. Um, the real summary here, though, is that secondary and tertiary alcohols dehydrate via a carbocation intermediate. It's that the formation of the carbocation that makes this an E1 mechanism, and the fact that that isn't stable for primary theoretical carbocations is the reason that this is E1 and this one's E2. I don't know if that last sentence made sense, but you've already watched 11 minutes of this video, so I'm sure you're on board. Thanks for being with me, and best of luck.